Hey everybody, my name is Jim. Welcome to Vaughn Forest Church. That introduction, where did that come from? Those words come from the introduction to a Gideon Bible. So if you ever see a Gideon Bible in a hotel, open up the inside and you'll read that introduction. It's pretty awesome. Well, whether you're in person or online, we're glad you're with us today because today we are bringing a conclusion to a series we've been in called Why Bother with the Bible? It's a great question. Somebody once said that a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to a person that isn't. It's a lot of value to studying the Word of God, and we've been talking about that. Today, we're going to wrap the series with a message titled, One Habit That Rules All Habits. One Habit That Rules All Habits. If you have a Bible, turn to James chapter 1. We'll be in the back of the Bible, in the, in the letters section, James and chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have everything on the screen so we can move through the message together today. I do want to encourage you, if you've yet to download the Vaughn Forest Church app, I would encourage you to do so. Just go to the app store on your phone, type in Vaughn Forest Church, quick download, and you'll be able to get connected to any of the events we've got going on. But then also, each weekend, the message notes are right in the app, and the Bible's built right in, so you'd have it all right there. So I want to encourage you to download the Vaughn Forest Church app. We're going to begin today with a question. Here's a question. How powerful are habits? By show of hands, how many of you have ever tried to quit a bad habit and found it was just too hard? Because you ended up quitting on your quitting, right? Maybe you thought, man, I want to improve my language. So you put a cost jar in your kitchen and you realize, wow, that's a great way to fully fund your retirement quicker than you thought. The reality is habits are very powerful. Here's a little newsflash, though. First, we make our habits. Then our habits make us in return. It's true negatively. A negative habit ends up making us negatively. But then it's also true positively. In fact, a 2006 Duke University study concluded that we spend more than 40% of our waking hours doing, engaged in, habitual activity. In other words, God hardwired each of us to be creatures of habit. And that can be a really good thing that works for you, but can also be not such a good thing that can work against you. We are creatures of habit. Now think about this word habit. Habit in the Latin comes from the word habitare, which means to live or to dwell. Now, now think about your daily habits like this. Every day we make choices, and those choices become practices. And those practices are kind of like building a house that you're going to have to live in it. So our choices result in practices or habits. Think about habitation, habits. These are the daily practices that, that we live in. In other words, we inhabit the daily practices that shape the way we think, the way we feel, what we do, even shapes what we become. Here's a question, though. If there was one habit, one habit that could positively influence every other habit in your life, question, would you build that habit? If there was one and it just positively affected all the rest of them, would you build that habit? Well, the good news today is that according to Scripture and according to loads of scientific research, there is, in fact, one habit, that if you have this habit, it rules all the other habits in a positive way. Of course, the habit we're talking about is called Bible engagement. What do we mean by that? Here's the definition of Bible engagement. It's the habit of reading the Bible no less than four times a week in an unfolding way. This is different from Bible study. This is just simply reading through the Bible no less than four exposures a week, and you're moving through it in, in an unfolding way. Now, like I said, there's a lot of science behind it. I'll just give you three quick studies. Those of you who love to, to get into the studies, I'll give them to you. In 2012, there's the LifeWay Research Transformational Discipleship Study. It found a whole list of factors. These are habits and practices that result in transformation in the life of Christ followers. The number one habit they found that disproportionately influences all the other habits, Bible engagement. Reading through the Bible no less than four times a week, just unfolding way, moving through the Bible. A second research project was the Center for, the Bible, for, for Bible Engagement. They studied the lives of 100,000 Christians. That is a huge set of data. And they found the number one life change component, Bible engagement, four exposures, no less a week of moving through the Bible by just reading it. And then there's the Willow Creek Reveal Study of 2007. Same thing, four times a week. Jesus put it this way. He said, if you abide in my word, you know what the word abide means? It means live. 
If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's John 8, 31 and 32. So the question is, what does it look like for us to develop this habit that influences all of our other habits in a positive way? It's a great question. That's what we're going to look at today, but here's our big idea. We'll start with this thought. Here it is. Your life will never rise above your habit of God's word. My life will never rise above my habit of God's word. Now help me out. I don't want to hear your voice. True or false? We choose our own habits. True or false? It's true. I choose my own. I can't choose your habits and you can't choose my habits. We have to each choose our own habits. Now if you want to live the life that God intended, then you have to have the habits that God intended. It turns out the one habit that changes everything is Bible engagement. In fact, I just want to share with you just a personal example. So years ago, I worked at a church that has now become the most influential and largest church in the U.S. It's called Life.Church in Oklahoma City. And I was one of their pastors. I was really a pastor to pastors. And one of the guys that I was uh, working with who worked under me, his name is Stefan Reed. And Stefan posted this on Facebook just a few years back. So I want you to notice this Bible and then this torn up Bible reading plan, okay? Here's the post. Stefan posted, I read through my Bible for the first time when I was challenged by Pastor Jim Botts who said, I don't think much of a pastor who hasn't read through the Bible. Wow, that's kind of a harsh thing to say now that I think about it. Anyway, he goes on, it hit me like a brick, not only as a pastor, but as a follower of Christ. I hadn't read the entire story of my Savior. That set me on a path to read the entire Word of God every year after that. What started out as a fresh reading plan and a new Bible, 11 years later, is now a tattered guide and a Bible held together by duct tape. That's awesome. It's been the greatest joy of my spiritual life, getting to know Jesus by reading the Bible. Thank you, Pastor Jim Botts, for pushing me to grow. There's always a sense of wonder and amazement and the pride of accomplishment every time I finish the Lord's book. If you haven't read through the Bible, what are you waiting for? Everything you've ever wanted to know about God and life and challenges, joy, hardships, celebrations, growth, learning, etc., are locked inside the Word of God. And you won't get these secrets for free. You've got to read it. But once you do, I promise your life and your relationship with Christ will be richer and fuller because of it. Start a reading plan. Pick up the Bible and get to work. You won't be disappointed. Enjoy the journey. Now, I can say this. Not only has Stefan grown spiritually, Stefan has grown in his leadership and impact exponentially. His life matches his habit of God's word. Here's our big idea for today. Or uh, I'm sorry. Here's what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon was a preacher in the 19th century. He wrote these words, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. Visit many good books. Why would I live in the Bible? Well, here's why. Because your life will never rise above your habit of God's word. Look at it this way. Your relationships, the quality of your relationships will never rise above your habit of God's word. Your parenting, your marriage will never rise above your habit of God's word. Your mental health, your way of thinking will never rise above your habit of God's word. Now, we're not saying that everyone has to be a Bible scholar. What we are advocating is that everyone take a relational approach to the Bible. Relational. Think about human relationships. In our human relationships, our human relationships are only as good as the communication that we have. Bad communication, poor communication, no communication, Bad relationship, poor poor relationship, no relationship. And it works the same way with God's word. As we engage God's word, we learn his will. We discover his voice. We tune our lives to the character and to the will of God. And so when it comes to like starting this habit, that's what we're going to do this week on our podcast. So for those of you who tune into our podcast and those of you who don't, I just want to invite you to tune in this week to the other six podcasts because we're going to get into very specific detail on how to start the habit of God's word. So look for that this week. But we're going to be in James chapter 1 today. And a little background before we jump into our passage. James, he is the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus in Nazareth. And he was not a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says that when Jesus was appearing alive to many, he appeared specifically 
to James. He showed himself to be alive to James and he became a Christ follower. And then he became a major leader in the early church. And he writes this letter that we call the epistle to James. Epistle means a letter. And, and he writes this letter to Christians who are struggling under significant adversity. The passage that we're going to be in, in chapter 1, verses 19 through uh, 27, the word word, as in word of God, occurs four times in this passage. Four times. Verse 18, verse 21, 22, verse 23. Why does the word word, like word of God, occur so often in such a short passage? Because James is showing us this is the one habit that rules all habits. This is the one thing that can get you everything. So in James chapter one, we're going to see a couple of things. And the first thing I want to show you is that we are to take in God's word habitually. We're to take it in to our lives habitually. Let me see your hand if you've ever heard of the phrase, you are what you eat. You ever heard of that statement? I mean, the basic idea is that the health of your body is a direct reflection of the diet that you consume. Now, here's a scary thought. What's true of food is also true of information. Like your life is a direct reflection of the information that you consume. It's the same kind of thing. Whatever we take in, whatever we consume the most shapes the type of person we become the most. Now the truth is, I mean, few of us would knowingly ingest garbage into our bodies, like, right? No offense to any of our fast food friends among us. I mean, few of us would do that. But the reality is many of us do ingest garbage into our minds unwittingly through the information that we absorb every day, all day. News feeds, social media posts, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, ads. I mean, you name it. According to scripture, we need to develop our own soul feeding habit of engaging God's word. So James says it this way, James chapter one, verses 19 through 21. He said, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, Slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I draw attention to the word anger. It occurs there twice. You notice that? Right? Be slow to anger. Anger of man doesn't do the righteousness of God. Here's a question. Why are we talking about anger? I thought we were talking about the Bible. Why, why are we talking about anger? Well, here's why. James is pointing out real barriers to God's word in our lives. In fact, if you look at the experience that these Christ followers were going through in just James 1, you'll see they were undergoing significant trials. They were undergoing significant testing. Their faith was being tested. And they were going through significant temptation. That's a lot of difficult stuff. And what was happening is they were going through so much hard stuff in so many areas of life, they started to get angry. And the Bible's not saying don't get angry. They were growing angry. Things were growing angry. They were becoming impatient. And as a result, they were unable to listen to God and his word any longer. By show of hands, how many of you figured out that a bad attitude can affect your ability to listen? Anyone? Don't know about your spouse. We all know. One time, Rose and I got in a really serious, like, heated argument. Imagine that. And I got so angry, I just marched off. I said, fine, I'll just go read my Bible over here. And it was back before cell phones. And so I had a, a pocket Gideon you know, Bible. And so I sat down and I just randomly opened my Bible and I looked down and my eyes fell on these words. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James 1.10. I was like, dope. You can't mix an angry, bitter heart with trying to take in the word of God. It just doesn't work that way. One gives way to the other. And James says, therefore, put away all, all the things that can just get in the way of taking God's word to heart. Whatever those things are, put them away. In fact, we have a choice to make. And the choice is yours. The choice is mine. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have a choice. I have a choice. You have a choice, right? Now, let me see your hand if you've ever planted a garden before. Anybody ever plant gardens before? So you have a green thumb. I have a brown thumb. In fact, I have two of them. When you were planting your garden, let me see your hand if when you were planting your garden, you were like, oh, okay, so here's where the garden's going to be. Let me see your hand if when you were planning that out, you said, oh, and here's the place, here's the spot for the weeds. Anyone? <laughs> said no and never, right? You don't plan a spot for weeds. You can't plant seeds if you know 
you're leaving weeds. In the same way, James 1, 19 to 21, shows that there are some inner disposition issues that can really affect our ability to receive God's word and grow God's word in our lives. It's the things in the text are like anger, pride, you know, like filthiness is another one. And so what James is saying, I want you to notice this word, uh, receive. He said, put away all that stuff. Just put that away and then receive with meekness the implanted word. This word receive in the original language of the New Testament in Greek is dekomai. It means to take in. Also, this word is translated in other passages to welcome. Welcome. In fact, turn on the movie screen in your mind real quick. And I want you to picture, picture a welcome mat. A welcome mat. Over the heart of every transformed person whose life has been changed by God's word, there's a welcome mat. It welcomes God's word as a daily companion. So let me ask you, before your heart every day, do you lay out the welcome mat or more like the do not disturb sign? No thanks, God. I got this. I can handle this on my own. Reality is, friends, um, when it comes to God's word, when we welcome God's word as a daily companion, we are setting ourselves up for some serious transformation. So when you go, how do I do a daily habit again? This week on the podcast, we're going to get intensely practical. We're going to get really into some details on how you can begin this habit. But notice I want you to see the key is in verse 21. He says, receive with meekness the implanted word. This is a metaphor. Now we're seeing a word picture that God's word is like a seed. Remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We were in Luke chapter 8, and we looked at the parable of the soils, that God's word is a seed. And when it comes to God's word, it's not about what you know. It's about what you grow. It's about letting the word of God grow in your life. In fact, here's a Bible verse you can memorize if you want. 1 Peter 1.23 says that, For you have been born again, not through a perishable seed, but through an imperishable seed, through the living and enduring Word of God. Think about a seed for a moment. Just think about seeds. Seeds produce life. In fact, so much of the life on our planet, a lot of it depends on seeds. Approximately 70% of all of our food supply comes from seeds. Things like corn, wheat, rice, barley, rye, peas, beans, soybean, peanuts, oats. And the other 30% of our diet comes from animals that are fed seeds. So a lot of our life depends on seeds. The same way that life springs from the seed, so also God's word is that one thing that brings life to everything. So the bottom line is when we talk about the habit of God's word, it's a habit that you have to cultivate. I have to cultivate. Our lives will never rise above our habit of God's word. It's something that we have to cultivate. So everybody do me a favor. Answer aloud, yes or no. Here we go. Do seeds take time to grow, yes or no? Do plants require ongoing care and cultivation, yes or no? Yes. Do weeds pose a constant issue, yes or no? Yes. In the same way, the habit of taking in God's word. It's, it's the habit that feeds your soul, but it's also the habit that weeds out your heart. It's the one habit that rules all the habits. In fact, uh, leadership expert John Maxwell wrote these words. He said, nothing will ever change in your life until you change something you do in your everyday routine. If you want God's word to have its intended impact in your life, something's got to change in your everyday routine. It's got to become a habit. So if you ask, well, how do I start the habit? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll suggest it this way. Anytime I try to start a spiritual habit that I don't yet have, here's what I do. Here's what I do. I connect the habit that I want to start with the habit that I already have. Take a habit that you want to start and then take a habit you already have, connect those two together. It'll be a whole lot easier. So look at it this way. Me, I have a habit. Every morning I drink coffee. And so many years ago when I wanted to, to establish a daily habit of God's word, I decided I would, I would take my daily habit of drinking crack cocaine, I'm sorry, coffee, <laughs> and I would take my habit of reading God's word and I would just put those two together. So when I open my Bible, I have my coffee. When I go get coffee, I automatically gravitate to my Bible. See how that works? You take the habit you already have and the habit you want to have, and you pair the two up. So let me ask you, what's your habit? Some of you have regular habits, like lunchtime. Some of you, man, lunchtime every day, I do the same thing. I go sit in the break room, or I get in my car, or I go for a walk. Great. Take that habit and take the habit of God's word and 
connect it to that habit. Some of you have dinner habits. And we always go for a walk before dinner. Or we sit around and talk after dinner. Great. Whatever your habit is, take that habit you already have and take the habit of God's word and connect the two together. Because the reality is, friends, God's word truly is that one habit will be the one habit that will rule all the rest of your habits. Nothing will transform the way you pray like the habit of God's word. Nothing will transform the quality of relationships like the habit of God's word. You will catch forgiveness issues and bitterness issues so quick with the habit of God's word. Nothing will transform the way you serve others in this world like the habit of God's word. Nothing will transform the way you engage people who don't know Jesus like your habit of God's word. Nothing will affect the way you handle money in this life like the habit of God's word. It really will change your life as a habit. One day, a cannibal in the South Sea Islands who recently became a follower of Christ was sitting next to a boiling pot and he was reading his Bible. An anthropologist came up to the, to the man and he said, what are you doing? And the native was like, I'm reading the Bible. And the anthropologist was like, man, haven't you heard that modern civilized man has rejected that book as irrelevant and unscientific? And the former cannibal looked at him head to toe, toe to head, he said, sir, if it wasn't for this book, you would be in that pot. <laughs> Friends, God's word will change everything about you into what God intended when it becomes your habit. The truth is, your life will never rise above your habit of God's word. What does that look like? Well, first of all, we are to take in God's word habitually, but secondly, we are to act on God's word habitually. We are to act on God. God's word as a habit. Now, let me see your hand if you've ever been talking to someone and you had to point out something on their face that they did not see. You ever had to do that? It's like, oh, you got lettuce in your teeth. I'm sorry, your makeup is your lipstick or whatever. That's just such a difficult thing to do. One time I had the opposite experience. Way back in the 90s, I was working in a factory. I was doing maintenance on a machine. And I was the supervisor, so I went down the line, machine to machine, checking on each of the, the orders that were happening and checking in with my employees as I was on my way to the bathroom. And once I got through the line to the bathroom, I went in and looked in the mirror, and I had this giant grease swath just across my face. And I was like, why didn't anybody tell me? I just literally went down the line and talked to everybody. So after I washed up and I came out, I went to the last guy I talked to, the last guy in the end. I go, hey, dude. Why didn't you tell me I had something on my face? He was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I saw you come out of the bathroom earlier. You didn't do anything about it. So I thought you knew. Like, what? Thought I knew. By show of hands, how many think it'd be weird for somebody to go in the bathroom, see a big black greasy thing, and go, eh, that's fine, I'll leave it. Is that weird to anyone? I mean, it's weird to me. Friends, the habit of taking in God's word is the first step to transformation, but it's not an end in itself. The habit of taking in God's word has to result in the habit of acting on God's word. In fact, it was Vance Havner who put it this way. I love Vance Havner. He always says it right. He says, much Bible instruction nowadays is like taking swimming lessons on dry land. There's no connection between what is taught and actual experience. Friends, that's a big issue in Christianity right now. A whole lot of swimming lessons. Ain't nobody been in the water. Now, James, the writer of our letter, he is a blue-collar scholar. In other words, he is just a regular dude who's about as practical as it gets. So James gives us two ways we can be acting on God's word as a habit. Here's the first one. You can write this one down. The first one is letting it work on me. Letting it work on me. We're in verses 22 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. What a great description of God's word. The law that gives liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his 
doing. I want to draw attention to the word doer. You notice it occurs there three times? Be doers of the word, verse 22. Be doers of the word, verse 23. Be doers of the word, verse 25. What's the opposite of a doer? Well, in this text, the opposite of a doer is a hearer only. In fact, the word hearer occurs three different times. Oh, and did you notice verse 22? It has a warning attached to it. Don't be hearers only who deceive themselves. You mean I can hear God's word and deceive myself? Oh, yeah. I mean, think of it this way. Imagine if you were accountable to another friend and you're holding each other accountable to work out, to exercise. And imagine you call that person and go, hey, did you work out today? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read three articles on working out. Yeah, I'm good to go. You're like, um, okay, great. You read three articles. But did you work out today? Oh, yeah, totally. Like I said, I read three articles. Oh, and I also watched a couple YouTube videos on proper technique. So, yeah, I'm good to go. You're like, but did you work out today? Of course I did. I told you. I read these articles. I watched some video. What do you mean? Welcome to Christianity in America. Because there are many who think just hearing God's word, that's it. That's it. We're done. We're good. That's like reading a menu and thinking you've eaten a, a nutritious meal. No, reading a menu is not eating a meal. Reading an article and working out is not working out. Hearing the word is not doing the word. We're called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And if you only hear it and go, that was great, and you hold up a scorecard on what you thought about, that's not the goal. That's a good way to deceive yourself. So what are we supposed to do then? Well, I'll draw your attention to verse 23. Notice the last words in verse 23. Looking intently at his natural face in a mirror. Here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to treat God's word like a mirror. By show of hands, how many of you look in the mirror today? Raise your hand. Go ahead, raise your hand and keep it up. Look around at those of you who have your hand down. We can tell. <laughs> Looks like you combed your hair with a pillow. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. Mirror. Look in a mirror. When you get up every day, one of the first things you do, after you probably use the restroom, you look in the mirror. In fact, you wouldn't even dare ever to walk out of the house and leave your house without first looking in the mirror. In fact, few of us would really ever pass a chance to check ourselves in the mirror. One time I was eating lunch with a group of friends at Panera Bread, and we were seated at a table, there's a whole group of us, right in front of the long window wall, the reflective window wall right by the entrance. And a woman came walking by right at lunchtime. She goes walking by, and she caught her reflection in the mirror. And what she did is when she caught her reflection, she slowed down. And she started to look at herself, you know, toe to head, head to toe, back to front. She walked up to the, to the window, and she looked in, checked herself, looked at her makeup, adjusted herself, and then she walked into the entrance. Well, there was a long line right out to the door. So when she walked in and got in line, she looked over and saw our whole entire group sitting right in front of that window. She looked at the window, she looked at our group, looked back at the window, looked back at her group, and our whole entire group waved at her. She turned beet red. Here's a reality check, friends. The whole purpose of a mirror is to show you what you really look like. And God's word functions similarly. It will show you what you really look like, the current state of what you really look like. Now, according to James, whenever you read the Bible, when you read God's word, guess what else is happening? God's word is reading you. God's word will show you what you really look like in light of God's perfect character and God's perfect will. You will see yourself in that light. And one of the things that God will show you, he will show you how he wants to work on you. This is what we're working on in you. So as we open the Bible, what are we supposed to do? Here's a few things you can write these down. First thing is you can examine yourself daily. So when you open God's word, just get ready to examine yourself. Verse 23 goes on, says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Notice those words, looks intently. Two words in English, one word in Greek. In Greek is katanoeo. It's not a quick look. It's an assessment. It's to take an assessment. This very word was used of the apostle John when he ran to the empty tomb, finding out that Jesus had been raised. He looked into the empty tomb and found it empty. And that's what he did. He made an assessment. Funny thing is, it's the exact same word used of Mary. When Mary ran to the empty tomb and looked in, she assessed it like, 
What's really happening here? We should do the same thing. The scriptures were given to us by God to clearly reflect the truth of ourselves and of our lives in light of God's character and God's will. In fact, E. Paul Hovey, a pastor of about a century ago, wrote these words. Hovey said, People do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. When you open the scriptures, you are not going to find a filtered Instagram photo of what you look like. You're going to get the true reflection from God's word. And in light of his character, in light of his will, here's what you look like, and here's where God wants to get to work on you. Why would God do that? Here's why. Because he loves you. He loves you. So the first thing we can do, examine yourself. Uh, the second thing you could do is know yourself daily. And now we're in verse 24. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. What he was like. Help me out, true or false. Sometimes what you see in the mirror will shock you, true or false. It's true, sometimes you look in the mirror and you see wrinkles. You're like, where did that come from? I don't get wrinkles. Why do I have a wrinkle? Sometimes you look in the mirror and you, you see a gray. You're like, what? Oh, no, not on my watch. Boop, pull that thing out of there. Sometimes you'll look in the mirror and you'll see a stray. Am I supposed to have hair growing out of the top of my nose? I don't think so. The same is true of the mirror of God's word. The scriptures will reflect you as you really are. Wrinkles, grays, strays, and all. Remember now, James says that a person who deceives themselves, that's a person who, who opens the Bible, looks in and goes away and forgets what he's really like. So let me ask you, what do you really like? Do you know what you're really like? Because here's the bottom line. Others will lie to you. People will lie to you. You can lie to you. We already saw it in the Bible. But listen, the mirror of God's word never lies. It will never lie to you. So I'm wondering, like right now, just let me ask you, what is the mirror of God's word reflecting to you about you right now? Just where we are in this particular passage. What is the mirror of God's word reflecting to you? Because God is saying to us, hey man, when you open my word, like examine yourselves daily, know yourself daily, and then thirdly, adjust yourself daily. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's what it's for, to set you free from selfishness, set you free from other little agendas and are not God's liberating agenda, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, this one will be blessed in his doing. Now, every day there's a message in your mirror. Sometimes you look in your mirror and shave that, wash that, brush that, pop that, pluck that. I mean, there's a message in the mirror. Truth is, we look in the mirror every day in order to see and adjust. That's why we look in the mirror. We want to see so we can make the adjustments. And the point of looking into God's word is to examine ourselves, to know ourselves, and adjust ourselves in light of God's character and God's will. When we see who God is and we see what God's will is, we want to align ourselves to God and to his will. Notice there's a promise in this text that the doer who acts on God's word will be blessed. Now, this is not generically acting. Let's just do stuff. It's about looking in the mirror of God's word and seeing what you look like and adjusting your life and what you look like to what God is like. The action is adjusting your life to God. This is the person who is blessed. So the blessing of God's word doesn't rest on the hearing of it. It rests on the doing of it. And the doing of it very much looks like aligning our lives to God's, adjusting ourselves to God's character and to God's will. Now, there are about 900 translations of the Bible into English. It's a lot, 900. Here's a question. Which one's the best one? We'll call it the doer's translation. The best translation is the one that you do, where you translate the Bible into action, your real-time adjustments of yourself to the character of God and to the will of God as you understand it in the Scripture. So here's what we're saying. We're saying that God's Word is given to us to be a mirror 
to let God work on you to change you. It was not given to us to be a magnifying glass for you to use to change other people. And there are many of us, you've experienced that at the hands of others, that they use the Bible to try to change you. And that is in violation of what God intended for his word. So if you've experienced others trying to change you from God's word, that wasn't God, that's not the right thing. God wants to change you. He wants to turn you into the person that you were meant to be. And that's what looking into the mirror of God's word will do. We see the character of God and the will of God and we see ourselves and we, by God's grace, can align ourselves. So first of all, acting on God's word, it's like letting, letting God work on me. But the second thing, and finally, James says, it's about letting, letting, it, letting it work through me. There is a time to influence others with God's word, but not the way we normally would think. Look at verse 26 and 27. For if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Notice that word religious occurs three times there. This word in the original language occurs only here in the entire Bible. There's one reference to one of its cognates in the book of Acts, but this is pretty much it right here, religious. Now, I want to offer you a guilt-relieving statement. Here it is. God's word was given to us not to make us more religious, but to make us more like Jesus. And that's really good news. A religious approach to the Bible is different from a relational approach to the Bible. The Bible was given to us not to make us more religious, but to make us more like Jesus. How does it work? We'll be taking it in and then acting on it habitually. In fact, did you notice in verse 26 that there's a warning in here? If you're going to take a religious approach to the Bible, here's a warning. That a person who takes a religious approach to the Bible deceives his own heart. A religious approach to the Bible is, is using the Bible to help you seem more religious, appear more religious, and maybe even speak more religiously. It's of all about the outside, looking the part. But a relational approach to the Bible would be all about letting God work on your inside to transform who you are so that it works its way out. So what other people see from you is a growing, transforming person. What does that look like? Look at verse 27. Notice the words orphans and widows. Why all of a sudden are we talking about orphans and widows? It's out of nowhere. Well, Orphans and widows were the neediest people of that day. There were no government programs to help. Orphans and widows, by definition, do not have a support system of family or anyone. Orphans and widows in that day lived hand to mouth, day to day. They were literally the most helpless and vulnerable people in the population. So the true test of a life transformed by God's word is showing God's care to the most vulnerable helpless and defenseless people around you. That sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Showing God's care to the most vulnerable people who are around you. The greatest proof of the reality of God and his word is a changed life. And James refers to it in verse 28 as being unstained from the world. So instead of developing our habits like the world does from the same place, instead of reflecting our world, we're developing our habits from God's word and reflecting God's word. It's to live unstained by the word. We are shaped by God's word as a habit. In fact, Dion Moody put it this way. He was a 19th century evangelist. Moody said, one, uh, uh, out of 100 men, one will read the Bible. The other 99 will read the Christian. Bottom line is we really are the only Bibles that some people in our everyday world are ever going to read. You really are the only Bible that some people in your everyday world, some people in your class, you're the, Bible, the only Bible they're ever going to read. Some people on your team, it's your school, work team, it's your gym, your neighborhood on that street. You may be the only Bible that they ever read. Which translation are you going to be? Because the reality is, friends, when God's word becomes your habit, it's the one habit that positively influences all habits. It's the one thing that changes everything. Fact is, the habit of God's word, it will transform your life. Not all at once, little by little, day by day, as a habit. 
Theologian G. Campbell Morgan was a 19th century preacher who became world famous as a preacher. One time he was touring in Italy and uh, he went to a cemetery. They just took him to a famous cemetery where a bunch of very famous people were buried. And while he toured this cemetery, he came across a 600 year old tomb. This is fascinating to him. This 600 year old tomb had a huge marble slab over the grave. And many years ago, an acorn must have gotten underneath that slab because an oak tree grew out of that tomb. In fact, it cracked the whole marble slab and shifted it. And this whole scene just captivated G. Campbell Morgan. So Dr. Morgan, standing there looking at this, he wondered out loud. And he said, how does an acorn crack a four-inch marble slab? And one of the people in his group in the back chimed in, a little bit every day. Here's a question. How does the seed of God's word crack the thick selfishness in the human heart? Answer, a little bit every day. How does the seed of God's word crack the stubborn self-centeredness of our human heart? A little bit every day. How does it crack the greediness in the human heart? A little bit every day. How does it crack the bitterness of our human hearts? A little bit every day. The truth is, friends, your life, my life, will never rise above our habit of God's word. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that you are the speaking God. You love us, and you know that any relationship is predicated on good communication. So you initiated, you had your word, you breathed it out through your people over time and then had them write it and collect it together so that every generation would have access to knowing about who you are, your character and your will. And you did all of that for love. You love us. You want us to know who you really are. You want us to see what's really wrong. And you want us to see your son, Jesus, who came to make right what's gone wrong in us and in this world. Thank you for your word. And we confess today that for many of us, we have treated your word a little bit more like a magnifying glass to change and try to affect others and a little less like the mirror you intended it for us to look into, to be able to assess where we are in light of who you really are, a good, loving, holy, and wise God. In our prayer today, God, would you enable us to start the habit, to begin right away, to take the habit of your word and marry it up to some other habit so we can begin every day to lean upon you, to look to you, to listen to you and hear your very voice from your word shape our lives. May we establish by the power of your spirit this one habit to rule all habits. It's our prayer, the prayer of Jesus. He says, sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. So Father, as we open your word each day, would you sanctify our lives? according to your truth. Your word is truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.